And in chapter 39, I'm going to start reading in verse 21. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's hand because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Now, it came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, so they were in custody for a while. Now Joseph has been serving in Egypt now for several years. Um, probably close to around 11 years he's been there now. And he served in Potiphar's house probably most of those years, and now he's in prison. Now, it appears that he's living with Potiphar in the prison because you notice that the uh, captain of the guard in the prison, in verse 3 it says, he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard. The captain of the guard is most likely Potiphar, and that's probably Potiphar is still getting blessed, and he has uh, taken advantage of having Joseph live with him. Now, what happened is the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt did something which we're not quite sure, but it offended their lord. And for that, he was placed into political custody. They were both placed into political custody. Now, we have probably good insight into what their charge was because the butler was the one who was in charge of his uh, oversight of his vineyards and all the drinks that, the, uh, that Pharaoh would drink. And his, his job was to make sure Pharaoh was not poisoned. The uh, baker was in charge of all the food. And he also had the job of making sure that Pharaoh was not poisoned. It appears that there must have been a plot uncovered in some way for an attempt on the life of Pharaoh. And it was an attempt probably relating to poisoning of his drink or his food. And because he wasn't quite sure who was the guilty party, he placed both his butler and baker in prison until he could determine which one of these two men were guilty of oversight. So what happens is he puts him in the prison, and it appears that Potiphar, who is called the captain of the guard when he's first identified, is the one who's still in charge of the life of Joseph. And so what does Potiphar do, or at least the captain of the guard? He charges Joseph with the custody of these two men. In other words, Joseph was to serve them, to care for them, to keep an eye on them. And that's what Joseph was doing. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, dreamed a dream, both of them each man's dream in one night and each man's dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of his Lord's house saying, why do you look so sad today? They said to him, we each have dreamed a dream and there's no interpreter of it. Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God Tell them to me, please. Now, that's a very insightful statement. It's something that the modern world should get hold of. Don't interpretations of dreams belong to God? I was listening to a lady just the other day. She was being interviewed on a well-known uh, talk host show, and she was mentioning how that she had gone to a hypnotherapist, and she was also involved in what they call dream therapy. Dream therapy being that, depending on what theory you're involved in with dream therapy, Basically, what you're looking at is to analyze the dreams and see what, uh, what, uh, what kind of tensions you're working out in your dreams. And there are counselors who are called dream therapists who will ask you to describe your dreams. And you say, well, I don't dream. You know, everybody dreams. Well, I don't dream. Well, they say, when you dream and you wake up, immediately get a piece of paper and a pencil and write down your dream. And we'll discuss the elements of your dream. So they'll bring in uh, a diary of their dreams in the last week, and they analyze their dreams. They call that dream therapy. Well, you really have no way of analyzing dreams. There's no way that you can really understand what dreams are all about. And when it comes to somebody interpreting a dream, Joseph is correct. 
don't, the interpretations of dreams belong to God. Now, many years ago in another ministry, we started small groups. And in the small group, we had set up leaders, people who were to involve themselves in oversight of the small group. And I remember an occasion, we didn't hear about this until it was, it had been happening for quite some time. An individual who was to be the leader of the group was kicked out by the group. They mutinied against his leadership. And they installed another leader. And this other leader that they installed began to become the interpreter of their dreams. And rather than them just sitting down and talking about the Lord and praying together, this guy would sit there interpreting their dreams. Now, that's bad enough. He was also a coke freak. And who knows what kind of interpretations he was giving them. Because he was involved in drugs, heavy usage. And rather than being a group where he could have been healed, they rebelled against the leadership of that group, kicked out the one who was supposed to help them to grow, and they installed a man who was going to teach them what their dreams were all about. So we have to watch ourselves with dreams and interpretations of dreams. And we need to remember that, as Joseph said, God is the one who interprets dreams. No man, no magician, no sorcerer has the abilities of determining what a dream is all about. Only God knows the interpretations. And that's what he's saying here. Don't interpretations belong to God. Tell them to me, please. Now, the point was that he isn't God, but that he could take it to the Lord. Then the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, Behold, in my dream a vine was before me, and, the vine, and in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded, its blossom shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Now, anybody here would probably say, well, that has to relate to his job somehow. He was a man who served Pharaoh, you know, his, his drink. So we can figure that out ourselves, but the part of the interpretation that God gives to Joseph is three days and the exact interpretation. Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now he gets specific there. Now you and I would probably have said, well, that relates to tension on the job. But he says, the three branches are three days. Now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. And so he gives him a beautiful interpretation, something that should really encourage him. So he goes on and says, but remember me when it is well with you and please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For indeed, I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews and also I have done nothing here that they should put me in the dungeon. Now Joseph obviously saw that this man was not guilty of the charge. And what he's doing now is he's identifying with what it is in this man's life that this man had been falsely accused. Joseph says, so have I. I have been falsely accused like you. Remember me when you get out of this place. Use your influence, in other words, with Pharaoh to get me out. Well, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, in other words, he liked what was said, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream, and there I had three white baskets on my head. In the uppermost basket, there were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. So Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh from you. Now, isn't that nice? <laughs> You know, he heard this beautiful interpretation given to the other guy, so he took the chance of telling him his dream. But the point of his dream, as you'll notice, is he was, the, he was the baker. He was to take care of that food, and the food was unprotected, and the birds came and spoiled it. And it is typical of the fact that he wasn't caring for Pharaoh. He didn't provide for Pharaoh. And as a result of, uh, of that, he was going to be charged as guilty, and he was going to die. Now... It came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and the chief baker among his servants. Then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the, the cup in Pharaoh's hand. So right in front of everybody, Pharaoh goes up to his butler and restores him to his office, and the butler is so excited, he just takes the cup and serves him as he'd been doing in gratitude. He serves Pharaoh. But 
he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And that's typical. When something good has happened to us, we forget how the events, you know, occurred that got us to that position. So right away, he just eases back into his lifestyle of comfort and relaxation and forgets the man God used to, uh, to, uh, to uh, interpret his dream. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river, the river Nile. Suddenly, there came out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. Now, in the Egyptian religion, they had a god by the name of Osiris. Osiris was the god of vegetation and uh, of the uh, netherworld, of the spirit world. He was pictured in the Egyptian Book of the Dead as a bull, and he had seven cows who would follow him, that would follow him. And seven cows represented Isis, the goddess of fertility. And it appears that when Pharaoh had this dream, it was a significant dream, and it struck him in a religious sense because he's identifying with re religious Egyptian religious types. And he sees these seven cows, which would probably influence him as in a religious sense that something is being told to me by the gods. And these seven cows would leave a, uh, an impression that something is being told him. So it bothered him so bad, he awoke. The dream was so real, in other words. And you've woken uh, uh, from dreams that were so real that you couldn't believe that you'd been dreaming. You kind of just look around the room and you think you're someplace else or you should be doing something else and you realize, no, it's just a dream. Well, that's what he did. He awoke. It, it startled him and it was so real that he awakes and he says, gosh, what's going on? So he goes back to sleep. He slept and dreamed a second time. Suddenly, seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads blighted by the east wind sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. And we see later on in Exodus the power of the magicians. They have a real power, a demonic power, a satanic power, but they have real influence and power. And the Pharaohs had magicians, court magicians, who were capable of doing things in a supernatural sense. And so he calls these men, these men he's used to having around him, these men who are he's used to having influence him and give him religious instruction and, and uh, looking into the future for him. But none of them can help him. So the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each dreamed a dream in one night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now, there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream, and it came to pass just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. You see, the Egyptians only would let their hair and beard grow when they were in mourning, and the Jews would grow their beards. And, be, you know, so what they said is, we want you to appear before Pharaoh, so the first thing he had to do is he had to shave and he had to change because they were very caught up in ceremonial purity. And so that's what Joseph has to do. He shaves his beard and he changes his clothing and he makes it to, uh, to the court of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've dreamed a dream and there's no one who can interpret it, but I've heard it said that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, it is not in me. 
God will give Pharaoh an answer in an answer of peace. Now, now let me make a, a point of this right now. The general response human beings have when somebody starts to give them glory or attention, and, and think about this for a moment. He's been in prison now for 13 years. And not so much prison. He's been in Egypt for, for 13 years and in prison for a number of years. We know at least two. The desire of his heart is to get out of there. And I believe that Joseph could be prone to ego mania at this point and take upon himself glory. Anything, in other words, to get out of prison. Now, we already know he wants out. He already told the butler, don't forget me when you're before Pharaoh. Remember me and help me get out of this place. Because I've been placed here wrongly. And I'm certain that he has a tremendous desire to get out of there. And when Pharaoh calls him and starts talking to him and tells him, I understand that you can interpret dreams, the human ego responds generally with a, with a pride. Certainly I can interpret dreams. No sweat. No, yeah, I can help you. Boy, we've got to watch that. Because pride comes before a fall. And had he started boasting in his ability to interpret the dreams, he would not have received interpretation for it. And he'd have been smack dab right in the middle of prison again. It's something we've got to watch. When people come up to you and tell you they're so blessed by what you've done for them, always give glory to God. Never sit back saying, yeah, I'm quite a wonderful person, you know. Yeah, I studied so hard. I have discovered that, and this is the truth, and, and anybody here who teaches knows what I'm talking about. There have been many times when I've stepped off the pulpit feeling that I've just blown it. Just walk off thinking, oh, that was terrible. What a lousy sermon. I couldn't have, you know, sat in that congregation and listened to that. And, and people will walk up and say, you know, the Lord really ministered to me. And God is saying, you know what? He says, it's nothing that you say. And don't sit there thinking it's your preparation or your ability to speak. It's the Spirit of God. And always give God glory. Because I don't care how hard you prepare. If God doesn't anoint it, it's just words coming out of your mouth. If God doesn't anoint it, it's just words. And I don't care how eloquent you are, how learned you are, what kind of ability that you have innately. You know, I've heard people, I've heard so many people talk, and you can sense anointing and you can sense knowledge. You can sense when God is speaking, when God's got a word for you, and when somebody's just talking. It's the same thing like that old man and that, that actor who had an opportunity to recite Psalm 23. And the actor went up and he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he recites the psalm. And then this old man walks up and they said, would you like to recite your favorite passage from the scripture? And the old man says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he goes through the psalm. And the actor was heard later to say, I knew the psalm, but that old man knows the shepherd. And I really do believe that you can know a lot and not be anointed by God. And so when God, you know, gives you the opportunity to be used by him, never take the glory for it. Just say, it's the Lord. Praise God. It's the Lord. And God gets all the glory, and that's the key to ministry. And that's why God is blessing Joseph here. Because Pharaoh says, we've heard that you can interpret it, and Joseph says, it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, in my dream, I stood on the bank of a river. Suddenly, seven cows came up out of the river, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such ugliness as I've never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven, the fat cows. When they had eaten them up, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were just as ugly as at the beginning. <laughs> so I awoke. Also, I saw in my dream, and suddenly seven heads came up on one stalk, full and good. And behold, seven heads, withered, thin, and blinded by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to the magicians. But there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years. And the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after him are seven years. And the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. 
God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them, seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will uh, not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice, because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Notice in your study in the New Testament how Jesus, when he's making a point, often will say, truly, truly, I say unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you. When Jesus repeats himself, he's emphasizing the reality of what he's saying. It's the same principle that was used when God revealed to Pharaoh what he was going to do. He repeated himself, and in doing so, he made it sure this is what is going to happen. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. Let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land of the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. I want you to see something else in the life of Joseph. Notice that he doesn't elevate himself or place himself in the position of receiving a position. You know, Joseph, in other words, is saying, let Pharaoh have the wisdom to select who he wants to run the show. What would be best for Pharaoh to do would be to get a wise and discerning man to handle all of this. But notice he's not pushing for the role himself. All he's doing is giving good advice. Very often, I have encountered it in, in my life, not often, not, I shouldn't say very often because that, that's misleading. I have, I have encountered it before where people will have a suggestion in ministry that they believe will help the ministry, but in reality, what they want to do is take over that position themselves. They have an idea, and they have an idea for a man, and the man happens to be themselves. And it's interesting because you don't know whether they're sincere or not or whether they have a concern or not for the people. I really do believe that an earmark for ministry is to set yourself aside and let God choose who should take that place, whatever position that may be. I really don't believe in pushing for positions. As a matter of fact, in Scripture it says that we shouldn't. There was a man named Diotrephes in Third John who pushed for preeminence among the people. And there is a tendency in the church today for offices, people looking for them, looking for that position. And the Word of God says, hey, just be yourself. Just let God elevate you. Let God put you in the position and never push. And Joseph is a good example of a man who isn't pushing for position. He's just telling him this is the best thing for, for Pharaoh and for Egypt. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there's no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring, off his hand, and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in, his, in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And you know... Can you imagine the incredible honor that is for a Hebrew slave who's been in jail for the last few years? He's been taken out of jail and suddenly he's the second ruler of the great empire of Egypt. In just one moment, just one second. It's incredible. And he gives them these different clothings and things. It's a symbol of his authority, you know. It appears to me that the humiliation that Joseph has experienced has led him to the ability to lead and I really do believe that God uses the, the experiences that you and I go through to break us from pride, to break us from desiring to be exalted, to break us from the desire for position, to break us for the desire of attention. And what God does is he reduces us to dependence on him so no flesh can glory in his presence. And he will reduce you constantly to a usable state. It's very important for us to learn when God humbles us why he's doing it. 
And it's important for us to humble ourselves under his hand in order that he might exalt us in his due time. And when God begins a work in you and he places you in a position of being used in front of people, he'll always, and this is, this is something I, I believe is permanent, he will always give you a sense of inferiority in the position. You'll never be large enough to fill the boots, in other words. You'll never feel that you've done the greatest job. You'll always walk away. And so if you tell that to somebody, well, I'm walking away right now feeling like I just didn't do a good job, many times they'll look at you as being like you've got real low self-esteem. You know, That's the way people treat anybody who is humble. Our world doesn't know how to relate to humility at all. We see it as weakness. And if somebody walks up and says, you know, I just don't feel good about the service today, or I don't feel good about my service to the Lord, immediately the response is, don't be so hard on yourself. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit who's telling you you had pride while you were ministering. And you're walking away sensing that and sensing a need to repent. Many times you'll preach or teach a message that was for yourself. And you walk away humbled because you know that you don't live up to the message that you've been proclaiming. And God humbles you. And I believe that that's a permanent sense of, of uh, inferiority because the calling is larger than the person. And God is greater than you. And you always walk away that way. Does it mean that you don't feel good about yourself? No. It means you have a proper perspective of who you are and who God is. And rather than walking away feeling depleted in terms of, I'm not a good person, you're aware of your position before God, and you're humbled. And that's biblical. But unfortunately, many times people don't recognize that. And what they want to do is they want to lift you up and elevate you back into the flesh, rather than saying, well, whatever the Lord's do it in your heart, let him do it. We have a tendency of wanting to pull people away from what God wants to do in their life. God constantly keeps you sensing your need for him. And if you ever get to the day where you don't sense that need, then you should get out of the ministry. It's a bad place to be. So he elevated him. He made this prisoner second in command over the mightiest nation at that time. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I'm Pharaoh, and without your consent, now this is interesting, without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in the land of Egypt. In other words, you've got absolute power except for me. Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Paneah, which literally means, uh, or there's so many different interpretations, you know, uh, God is speaking and he lives. He gave him as a wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. At this point, when he gave him the new name, Joseph became a citizen in the nation of Egypt. And to seal that citizenship, Joseph was given a wife. And it appears to me that the wife Joseph was given must have been a woman who was open to the Lord. Because I believe that the children Joseph raised uh, were fairly, um, they were all right. As a matter of fact, you'll see later on, Joseph's father adopts him into his own family. And I believe that uh, the two sons that he has uh, are, are blessed by the Lord. So it, I would think that Joseph had a lot of influence and raised the, the children in a godly manner, and I'm certain his wife must have gone in the direction of the Lord. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now remember, he was 17 when he originally was kidnapped and sold, so it's been 13 years. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was without number. See, because God was blessing the grain. He was multiplying, it was increasing, and it was so much that they just stopped even keeping tallies of it. There's just too much grain. Joseph was born into Joseph was born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. And the reason was, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Manasseh literally means forgetting. And the name of the second he called Ephraim. And the reason he called him Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Ephraim literally means doubly blessed. 
Then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended. And seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. The famine was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. The famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. When Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look at one another? What are you guys doing standing around looking at each other? You know, we're starving here and you guys are sitting there. Now, it's been about 20 years now since he had seen his son Joseph. 20 years have passed. We know that because Joseph had spent 13 years uh, before he was elevated to the position of second in command. And we know that seven years has passed since the, uh, the seven years of plenty, and now they're in famine. So and it's been at least 20 years that he's been there in Egypt. So his father Jacob looks at all the boys and he says, why are you standing around looking at each other? He said, indeed, I have heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there that we may live and not die. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, lest some calamity fall on him. Now Benjamin at this time is about 23 years old. Joseph hasn't seen him in 20 years. The last time he saw him, he was just a little guy, three years old or so. And he sure loved his little brother. The sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now, Joseph was governor over the land. And it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Do you remember those dreams that Joseph had a little earlier? Oh, a few years before when he told his brothers, you know, I saw you bowing down to me and how upset they got. Well, what did they do? They come walking in there. Now, they look at this man as an Egyptian. He doesn't have a beard. He doesn't look at all like a Jew would look. He speaks Egyptian. And... They think their brother's dead by now. So there's no way they can recognize him because he's at least 37 years old. And I think I've changed a little since I was 17. You know, and I'm certain he's changed just a little bit too. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, where do you come from? They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they didn't recognize him. Then Joseph remembered the dreams. Man, this guy's got a good memory. It's been all those years, and he sees them bowing down in front of him. He says, oh, yeah, I remember those dreams. Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them, and he said to them, you're, you're spies. You've come to see the nakedness of the land. They said, no, my lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's son. We're honest men. Your servants are not spies. But he said to them, no. But you've, you've come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, your servants are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And in fact, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. That literally means one is dead. They think by this time that Joseph has died. One is no more. But Joseph said to them, it is as I spoke to you, saying, you're spies. In this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother and you shall be kept in prison that your words may be tested to see whether there's any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison for three days and I wonder what they felt like <laughs> sitting in there going, oh man. Now notice how your conscience works. Joseph said to them the third day, do this and live for I fear God. If you're honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your houses and bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. That's how your conscience works. 20 plus years by now, you would assume that it would have been buried for good, right? No. It was resting right at the top of their, right in the front of their brain. All it needed was a little punch in the back of the head, and it jumped out. 
And the very first thing they realized is we blew it. We blew it over 20 years ago, and now we're getting paid back because we're getting what we deserve. Reuben answered them saying, now there's a good old I told you so. Isn't that nice when you realize you've done something wrong and somebody is sitting next to you to say I told you so. Isn't that nice? I, I, that, that's, oh, that always makes me so, oh, it bothers me when someone does that. I already know I've blown it. When somebody sits there next to me and saying, you know, I told you, I told you you shouldn't do that. And it really gets to you. Reuben answered saying, did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy? And you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. So Joseph's there listening to everything they say. <laughs> and he turns himself away from them, and he wept. Then he returned to them again and talked to them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And it appears that he must have heard something in their conversation to realize that Simeon was the one who really instigated the, the idea of selling them. And so he got Simeon, and he bound him before their eyes. And Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks with grain and restore every man's money to his sack, and to give them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. So they loaded their donkeys with the grain and departed from there. But as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey feet at the encampment, he saw his money, and there it was in the mouth of the sack. So he said to his brothers, My money's been restored, and there it is in my sack. Then their hearts failed them. They were afraid, saying to one another, What is this that God has done to us? <laughs> Blaming God immediately. They don't see the grace of God. They just think of punishment immediately. And then they went to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, and told him all that, he had, all that had happened to them, saying, The man who is lord of the land spoke roughly to us and took us for spies at the country. But we said to him, We're honest men. We're not spies. We're twelve brothers, sons of one father, sons of our father. One is no more, the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the lord of the country, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine of your households and be gone. Bring your youngest brother to me, so I shall know that you're not spies, but that you're honest men. And I will deliver your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. Then it happened as they emptied their sacks that, surprisingly, each man's bundle of money was in his sack when... And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. Jacob, their father, said to them, You've bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, Now this is ridiculous. Now why would this bring his father, you know, any kind of joy? Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. I mean, really. You know, what kind of, you know... Like the father wants to kill his grandchildren. Right, that'll be, oh yeah, that'll make me feel a lot better, Reuben. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Put him in my hands and I'll bring him back to you. But he said, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother's dead and he's left alone. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then you will bring down my gray hair to sorrow, with sorrow to the grave. Now, the famine was severe in the land and it came to pass that they had eaten up the grain which they'd brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, go back and buy us a little food. You know, hunger is a good motivator. Up to that point, they had said, no, there's no way, I'm not going to send them. There's no way you're going back. And so they're eating, and they're eating, they're enjoying themselves, and suddenly they've got to eat again. So the first thing he says is, go back and buy us a little food. Judah spoke to him, saying, the man solemnly warned us, saying, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we'll go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother's with you. And Israel said, Why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you still had another brother? But they said, The man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our kindred, saying, Is your father still alive? Have you another brother? We told him according to these words. Could we possibly have known that he would say, Bring your brother down? Now, this is important. Judah. Judah is where Jesus traces his lineage from. Jesus being that one whom God sent to give up his life a ransom for the world. Now, look how Judah speaks. Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me. We will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be a surety for him. That's a type of Jesus Christ. That's how Jesus is. 
In other words, I'll be a substitute for him. I'll be an offering for him. I will be a substitute. I will be a surety for him. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we'd have returned this second time. And the father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessel. So they obviously had kept a little bit throughout the famine. Take some of the best fruits in your vessels and carry them as a, a down as a present for the man. A little balm, a little honey, spices, myrrh, pistachio, nuts, and almonds. Take double money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother also and arise. Go back to the man and may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your brother and Benjamin. If I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. So the men took the present and Benjamin and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt and they stood before Joseph. Then Joseph saw Benjamin with them. He said to the steward of his house, take these men to my home and slaughter an animal and make ready for these men will dine with me at noon. Then the man did as Joseph ordered and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house and they said it's because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we're brought in so that he may seek an occasion against us and fall upon us to take us as slaves with our donkeys. When they, in the nights, <laughs> guy invites them over for dinner and the first thing they think is they're going to have these guards hiding behind the door to jump on them and steal off their donkeys and things. The paranoids. Now the men were afraid because of that. When they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food. But it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks, and there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it back in our hand, and we have brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put the money in our sacks. But he said, Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. In other words, I've been paid. I received payment. Don't be so upset. Now that's grace. These people are coming to pay back something. And the man says, I've already see received payment in full. It's God who has blessed you. Now remember what they had said earlier. They said, oh, look what God has done to us. And they saw the grace of God in a negative sense. This man here, as a heathen, saw the grace of God in a positive sense. He says, we've already received the payment. Don't worry about it. It's already been paid in full. So he brought Simeon out to them. So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet and gave their donkeys feed. Then they came, then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that he would eat bread there. And when Joseph came down, they brought him the present. Then he asked them about their well-being and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They answered, Your servant, our father, is in good health. He's alive. And they bowed their, their heads down and prostrated themselves. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep, and he went into his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out and restrained himself and said, Serve the bread. You've got to understand the tremendous emotional stress this man's under at this point. Imagine that. He hasn't seen this guy since he was three years old. And he loved his little brother, and he's his full brother. He's his full brother. And he hasn't seen Benjamin. And Benjamin represents, I guess, everything close and dear to him. It represents his mother represents his father and he's there and he's been waiting and you know what this proves to us it proves that you can be elevated to a high position of prestige honor and power and you can be wealthy but if you don't have somebody significant to share your love with it's of no value and all he really cares about really is his father and his little brother and he's a tender man you see Joseph weeping several times which should be a, a very good Example to us men, to be free with our emotions, not to restrain ourselves when we feel that we've been touched in a tender way. 
So they set him in a place by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with them by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews. It's an abomination to the Egyptians. They couldn't stand the Hebrews. Now remember I, uh, I told you earlier that the Egyptians were racially different than, than the, the Pharaoh and, the, and those who were uh, ruling over them. And so the Egyptians didn't like to be around Semitic people. It was an abomination. It was an, un, an act of uncleanness to them. So they'd eat separately. They'd eat by themselves. And so they separated Joseph. Now, the reason they separated Joseph, and the brothers didn't pick up on this, is simply because Joseph was so powerful, he ate by himself. But they also separated the Hebrews from themselves because they were unclean in their sight, and they didn't want anything to do with them. Now, this is going to blow their mind, what happens here, because in verse 33, it says, They sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. So what Joseph had done is he had numbered them in, in age, all the way from the youngest to the oldest. And he had set them up. And the, and the brothers are looking, and they're blowing their mind, because that requires a one in 40 million chance that that would have taken place that this stranger in Egypt would have known their ages and placed them in the exact order. By random, it would come out to be one in close to 40 million that this could have taken place. That's why the men looked in astonishment at one another. How did he know that? <laughs> How did he do that? Then he took servings to them from before him, but Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. <laughs> Little pig. <laughs> so they drank and were merry with him. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also put the silver cup, my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, and his grain money. So he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. And when they had gone out of the city, they were not yet far off. Joseph said to the steward, Get up, follow the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks and which he indeed practices divination? You've done evil in so doing. Now, Joseph was not a man who used a cup to look into it like we use a crystal ball or something. That was just what he wanted them to say to them because they assumed Joseph to be an Egyptian. And so he utilized this silver cup as an opportunity to draw them back and uh, to cause them to be afraid. And that's what he did. Let's see now, where was I? Verse 6, okay, you've done evil in so doing. So he overtook them, and he spoke to them these same words. And they said to him, why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servant should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? From your Lord's house. With whoever, whomever of your servants. Now, this is, this is a hasty statement. With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die, and we also will be the Lord's slaves. He said, now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave, and you shall be blameless. Then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground, and each opened his sack. So he searched and began with the oldest and left off with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. Man, they must be upset by now. This was their father's last son. They already know that the old man is grieving over the fact that they had to go back. They had left Simeon there. He's already lost Joseph. Now Benjamin. And they've got to be, you know, this is what God does. He's tearing them and breaking them to the point of repentance. He's tearing them down, breaking them to the point of repentance. Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, and he was still there, and they fell down before him on the ground. Joseph said to them, what deed is this that you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? In other words, I know that you're thieves. You know I have my ways, find you now. Then Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. But he said, far be it from me that I should do so. But the man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, go up in peace to your father. 
And once again, we see Judah acting as one who would be a sacrifice. Judah came near to him and said, My Lord, please, let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing, and do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and child of and a child of his old age who is young. His brother's dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. So it was when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him, the words of my Lord. And our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother's with us, then we will, go, uh, we will go down. But we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother's with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons, and one went out from me, and I have said, surely he's torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. But if you take this one also from me and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please, let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father? Judah is an able representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying that he's morally perfect or pure in any sense of the word. Judah's not. But Judah represents the heart of Christ, the heart that was willing to sacrifice himself as a substitute. And it appears that Judah, through the years, has come to a sense of repentance and an awareness of the pain he's caused his father. As a result of that, he's not willing that his father should go through the suffering that his father will go for, I'll go through, if the little brother doesn't come back. And you're going to see that Joseph has brought these men to, with the Lord, of course, God has, through Joseph, brought these men to a point of repentance. And Judah is enacting the role of Judah here, that Jesus was going to enact completely and fully when he gave up his life, a ransom for many. Right now, we see that they're at the position where they've been broken. And you see how God does it. God used Joseph to continue to humble them and to break them and draw them to a point of repentance. And they finally have reached that point. And they can't take it anymore. And Judas says, I can't. I can't do what you're asking me to do. I can't go back and see this little old man with a broken heart. He says, man, he says, he loves this little boy so much that if this little boy doesn't come back to him, he'll die right there. His life is bound up with the life of his son. And that's the way it is when you're a parent. Your life is bound up with your children. And that's what happened here. He's not willing to let go, and he won't. 